So it's the same. I, I, I teach on the, the psychotherapy training program at the Philadelphia Association, where we do talk about Merleau-Ponty, I have to say. It's a, a phenomenological right. psychotherapy training. Um, so we talk about Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty and Wittgenstein and quite a few others, Chris Taylor <laughs> and others. Um, so I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and there's some more clinical reference, but I'm probably covering some of the same ground that Catherine covered, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to read my paper. I'm not sure I'm very good on PowerPoint, but I'll try and uh, break it up a bit. Um, I'm just starting with a few scenarios where, in a sense, the little body's in play. A teenage girl despises herself. Her body is fat. She is ugly. The mirror has a spell cast on it of uglification. Life is ugly too. She cuts herself with a blade from a pencil sharpener. The blood is in stark contrast to her horrible skin. The blood is pure, dark, red. The pain clears her head of whirling thoughts. For a moment she experiences stillness, but only for a moment. Ferilio, who you might know, work, walks along a Paris boulevard. He notices the buildings seem to maintain their shape as a constant. But the space between the buildings is constantly shifting with each step the space framed by his change in perspective. A gazelle fleeing from a leopard sees first the space between things, or we might imagine it does. In this flight, that space is all that matters. Hatred fuels many actions, which we see all around us. Hatred is visceral. Something in our guts moves us to violent thoughts and to violent actions. Anger makes us mad, says Seneca. My face contorts, my voice rises, my gestures look absurd from a distance. Up close, they are threatening and offer nothing to the other except fear, retreat, or a symmetrical response. And cruelty, where does that come from? I am talking to you. My tongue moves, my vocal cords vibrate, my head wags, my arms gesture pointedly or not. Perhaps my heart beats faster with the uncertainty of your response. Perhaps I walk up and down, searching for the thought or the word that will set us free. Where is my mind in all this? Where is my body? The problem of the body, as Catherine's been saying, is linked with the problem of time, the problem of the subject, the question of extension or space, and the question, as Heidegger asks, of technology. These questions are all re related and come together in a way of asking, how do we live? How do we take up being? How do we conceive of our relatedness to each other? Is everything we do a transaction, time efficient, goal directed? Another way, another question is, do we have time to wonder? For Wittgenstein, the impetus to philosophy is wonder, which requires an openness to existence and that we do not foreclose. This conference is asking that we think about existentialism in relation to therapy, and specifically we have the question about the lived body. I'm going to try and focus on two related areas, the question of measurement in the body, that is the objectification in the body, the technological approach to the body and to the world, which is the dominant mode that we live with, and then the question of how we have a body at all, which I think Catherine's really covered. Um, what does it mean to talk of the body, even of the lived body? As my wife said, what would it mean to have an unlived body? And I'm link a little bit to Wittgenstein's critique of language and the misuse of language. Um, um, and a few other well, I'll come back to that. As a doctor, one deals with bodily issues all the time. One is pragmatic and just gets on with it giving medication, doing blood tests and investigations, doing surgery. In psychiatry, it's more ambiguous, in spite of the trend towards neuropsychiatry or biological psychiatry. In certain instances, the body, the body is explicitly in the frame, in eating disorders with people obsessed with their body, in self-harm, in suicide attempts when people want to terminate their existence, their body, in dysmorphophobia, where people are obsessed with particular aspects of their body looking wrong, um, and in psychosomatic disorders, and disorders such as chronic fatigue, where the main symptom is exhaustion or pain. And a lot of teenagers are taken up with the, the body as seen by others. In anorexia, the young persons, girls mostly, but boys are much more often in this arena these days, um, the, girl does not, the young person does not want to be the way that she is. She, this translates into fat, shape, thighs, tummy, bum, sometimes the whole body. I hate the way I look, I hate myself, and they elide into each other, hatred of the body and the hatred of the self. 
Weight is all important. Some people weigh themselves several or many times a day. Sometimes wanting to die goes with it. It becomes so unbearable to look the way that she does. Our response is technological and goal-directed, and it's hard to argue with us at the most basic level when the young person could die. Um, we go for the BMI, body mass index, weight for height percentage, the, the beginning of the percentage of the ideal body weight, interesting idea. Uh, calories for weight restoration. We weigh the young person weekly, but try and stop them from weighing themselves obsessively, usually by getting parents to take away the scales. Basic. Um, trying to deal with the thinking in anorexia is difficult, and he says it's mostly CBT. Um, we don't have psychodramas. About, unfortunately. Um, that's the evidence-based practice that's um, recommended by NICE guidelines. That's what we're all constricted by. Um, and that treat, that's a very technological kind of therapy, treating thoughts as sort of some, some sense of cause of behavior. It's very debatable. So what I want to come on to, I mean, I'm not going to focus on anorexia particularly. It's not really my area of expertise. I'm not, as I say, work mainly in a home treatment team with young people who might be admitting because some of them are anorexic. So, so. um, what I want to come to now is the measure, question of measurement on the body. Heidegger in the Zollikon seminars considers the implications of extension, of measurement, and its relation to technology. As you know, Descartes divided the res extensa from the res cogitans, immediately kind of reduces the world to extension. The body is included in the category of extended things. It becomes a mechanical thing that is part of the world of existing things as spatial, as dimensional, belonging to that which is ready to hand. And we may now understand the world as four-dimensional. Heidegger says we can't really include time without really thinking as essentially about temporality and timelessness. And what it, or lived time as we what has become our ordinary, that is to say, scientific concept of space does imply time. Velocity links the two in Newtonian physics. In a world of efficiency and efficacy of treatment, time and motion are considered together. And what, as you know, there was a fashion for this in industry, but that's faded now with the information age. The question of the body is extended, and the relation to measurement is profound. Max Planck says, only that which can be measured is real. Galileo says something very similar. And so condemns us to a deranged life, as Heidegger emphasizes. Deranged, meaning that we have been thrown out of our range, out of the spaces that we dwell in, our relatedness to the world, our song lines, if you will. But I've got to be careful not to romanticize this. Think of an animal's range, the paths it treads around a familiar territory, uh, resting places, vantage points, the points where it might meet other animals of its own kind, or prey if it's a predator. Everything is extension is the same, in a sense. The Merleau Ponty, the extended world of things, con contrasts with the spatiality of existence. Here, the lived world is analogous with the lived body. As Richard Tilley, who's a Marxist archaeologist, says of the, of, of the objective, scientistic approach to archaeology, a meter in any direction is just that. An object's found can be related only by distance and the geological deposits they have found in. An archaeological dig becomes reduced to a grid. In contrast, in ritual space or a landscape where features have political, uh, have political perhaps, particular significance or meaning, measured distance is not so relevant. A meter to the right may be taboo, a meter to the left may be a communal eating place. Or to make it ridiculous, on a cliff edge, a meter to the left, I'm still with you, a meter to the right, I'm still with you. Um, the body we were to treat it as just a measurable thing, becomes an object among, among objects. It seems as though we do live in a world where this has happened in many ways. Many people seem to expect their body can be made into what they want it to be. I mean, enormous fashion, fashion for mm -hmm. plastic surgery and Botox and the rest of it. It's just make me what I want to be as an object. So Heidegger says, again, in contrast to that objectification, how do we measure sadness? Evidently, one cannot measure it at all. Why not? If one approached sadness with a method of measuring, the very approach would be already be contrary to the meaning of sadness. Here, even the claim to measure is already a violation of the phenomenon as a phenomenon. 
This is a bald statement that we're contradicted or rather acted against by much practice in psychiatry that has measure in scales to sadness, depression, anxiety, psychosis, psychopathy, personality, you name it, there's a measuring scale for it. All of it, I would say, a violation of the phenomenon as a phenomenon. Heidegger does allow that we do use apparently quantitative words to describe sadness and grief. We may be a little sad, or intensely and or profoundly sad. Our sadness may have a great depth. Moods have a depth. But this depth is not something that we can throw a sounding line into, except metaphorically. A landscape can have depth, but that depth depends on my mood, my openness. If I drive a Land Rover up a hill to take a photo, or even tramp for hours just to conquer the mountain, depth is nothing or is easy, easily lost in egoistic triumph. A depth, and I don't know if you know Nan Shepherd's book about um, the Cambourne Mountains, so the depth in a crevice can be more profound if I contemplate it, dwell with it, wonder about it, just even just notice it. Equally, I can ignore your mood <coughs> while reading the result of a measuring scale. Do I prescribe antidepressants or CBT? It all depends on the number. Do I understand you? Do I even notice you? Or are you one more extended body to operate on and move on? The problem of method in science is equivalent to the problem of the body, says Heidegger. The, measure, the method of measurement is what characterizes a scientific attitude. Does measurement belong to the thing, to we who measure, or to something further? As Heidegger says, measurement belongs to the thing as an object when it becomes a, that thing, when it becomes a thing that we want to or need to measure, we have a particular relatedness to it. Wittgenstein's critique is similar in some aspects. Think of the recognition of, a, of facial expression or of their description, which does not consist in the <coughs> measurements of the face. If, I, if our relationship is different, if, if I no longer adopt a scientific approach to you, I don't objectify you. If even my... I'm losing the track of what I'm saying. Um, yeah. If I don't objectify you, then other questions can come into play. Qu questions that have a different language game, we might say. Questions that do not lead to answers by a series of logical operations. We want to pain and expression. Heidegger, in thinking about the body, wants to see certain phenomena, blushing, grasping, pain and sadness. Wittgenstein also thinks about these in related areas. In a famous passage, Wittgenstein wonders how words and feelings become connected. How does a human being learn the meaning of names of sensations? For example, of the word pain. Here is one possibility. Words are connected with the primitive, natural expressions of sensation and used in their place. A child has hurt himself and he cries. Then adults talk to him and teach him exclamations and later sentences. They teach the child new pain behavior. Wittgenstein interrogates himself. So he was saying that the word pain really means crying. On the contrary, the verbal expression of pain replaces crying. It does not describe it. That's crucial. So when I yeah, when I say I'm in I'll come I'll go over that. How do I know you're in pain? Do I have to infer it from your behaviour? Do I have to infer you have a mind as Descartes? Freud, and right up to Baron Cohen, who I don't know if you know, he um, had the idea of the theory of mind in autistic children. They all imagine that you have to infer another person has a mind. This passage and the related, Wittgenstein's passage, and the related private language questions have been endlessly discussed. To put it simply, and perhaps rather crudely, Wittgenstein is putting in question the grammatical link and all the philosophical assumptions that find expression in that grammar between a so-called inner sensation, a private experience of pain, and a word that would name this experience. This leads to a puzzle as to how I can ever link my private experience with yours, or know that my pain is like yours via language that we share. How, another example is, how is my experience of red the same as yours, or can we ever be sure of this? If our language is first an expression, and to use Mulhall's phrase, and grafted onto bodily expression, 
think of words in certain situations. Just think of a, a screen which transforms into an to swearing. And we learn, and we learn as children to use certain forms of words in certain situations. It hurts, mummy. It hurts. In these situations where the sense is already apparent, then the meaning we could say speaks for itself. The hurt child cries. I, as a parent, see the hurt. I try to soothe the child. And amongst the many things I do in comforting the child, I use words, some of which are to do with acknowledging the child's pain and hurt. These words the child can then take up later as expression, whose, con whose context give the words their validation. I'm just thinking about abused children for a moment. One of the things that they don't get is words from the adults that are abusing them because the adults don't want the child to name their experience. They, they don't give them words to describe it. And then when you're trying to do therapy with an abused child, they're having to discover language that's going to describe what they've been through. Wittgenstein says, the human body is the best picture of the human soul. He has not been reductionistic. In discussing pain, Wittgenstein is clear we are very often, as you were saying, to see that another person is in pain. We do not surmise it. Equally, I cannot be said to know that I am in pain. I am in pain or not. You may doubt that I am in pain, or that my pain is as bad as I say it is, if you suspect I've got a reason for malingering or some other dissimulation. When someone comes to me expressing an emotional pain, it is complex. Is emotional pain a bodily pain? We can talk about the physiology and hormonal aspects of fear, anxiety, excitement, even love. Oxytocin, you've probably heard about, is a hormone and a transmitter in the brain. It's been linked with attachment and loving feelings. You could put an oxytocin injection and they fall in love. <laughs> Everything in the brain is mediated electrophysically, chemically, physiologically, yet knowing this does not help. Even in dementia, where the brain has definite physical deterioration, in dealing with the dementing person, one must attend to what it means to him, his fears, anxiety and horror at what has befallen him, and concern about how he and others will cope as the terminal process continues. Often there is a bodily expression of emotion, tears, flushed face, shouting at parents, self-harm, overdose. Interestingly, while it might be appropriate for someone to physically comfort the young person with a hug or cleaning the wounds, that's not what I usually get involved in, but I do acknowledge the pain. And as Cavell says, Stanley Cavell, you may know, acknowledgement is, a prof is profound here. The acknowledgement need not be words. Indeed, words may miss the mark or distort the sense of what has been shown. Silence can be important. The kind of silence in which I'm alert to the other person, often feeling moved, I do often feel very moved at the patients that I see. And sometimes, equally important, not feeling moved. Tanasini, in her feminist, feminist approach to Wittgenstein, discusses the problem of the subject as treated by Wittgenstein. There's no time today to go into, into this to any degree, but I just wanted to point out, she points out how much questions about the body in ordinary life come into Wittgenstein's work. And she links this with what's considered traditional woman's work, you know, ranging from, you could say, from care of expectant mothers, childbirth, babies, children, menstruation, care of the dying, even to gathering food and cooking, all to do with the body, all traditionally considered as, as women's, women's work. There's a lot more I could say about Tanasini, but unfortunately we put it in today. Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, Tractatus is showing the limits of our understanding of the self, which is kind of not understanding, really. And similar to the disappearing body, Wittgenstein says the self becomes becomes reduced to a point without extension, and there's a world then coordinated with that point. Okay, so this is, seems to repeat Descartes, but it's a response rather than a reprise. The I thus conceived as no thing at all, not some immaterial ghost in the machine. As Wittgenstein said, it's a limit of the world rather than a part of the world. What this means is quite difficult to extricate, perhaps beyond me today. Beyond the reality coordinated with the point that I am is no thing, and this point is no thing. I discover my world in this coordinated reality, and you discover yours in yours. We are separated but not isolated, and how we depend on each other for forms of life, for meaning, for acknowledgement, uh, Wittgenstein says more about in his later work. 
So, how are we going for time? There's a clock up there if you can see it. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going to skim over this a little bit. I, what I would say is that, in a sense, I was going to talk about how do we have a body. And in, in a sense, what we've already heard, and from a phenomenological point of view, we don't, there's no such thing as the body. The body is an abstraction. You can't really, I mean, this is problematic and difficult, but um, we don't really treat other people as bodies. And it's sur I'm talking about this with surgery. A surgeon doesn't operate on a body, but a living person, and hopefully, as long as it's not a weekend, will wake to the consequences of a surgeon's actions. Um, a torturer does not operate on a body, on flesh, but a terrified, perhaps abject person who knows full well, as does the torturer, the meaning of the actions carried out, the violation, the humiliation, the horrible anticipation, the damage done, and not only the immediate aspect of pain. <clears throat> so that the meanings are not just for the person tortured. They now transmit across the globe, you know, as we see with Saudi Arabia, with ISIS, with Iraq, with Guantanamo, 9-11, None of us are immune to this so-called terror. I and mean, if we are sensitive or have a vivid imagination, the suffering of the tortured person or the rage called up in one or another is all too palpable. We do feel it. You know. If we let ourselves feel it in our own flesh, if we call to mind exactly what that person might be going through. So as I say, that's tricky. So there's no such thing in the body. And I like, there's a quote from Merleau Ponty. I never become quite a thing in the world. The density of existence as a thing always evades me. My own substance slips away from me internally, and some intention is always foreshadowed. Bodily existence is never self-sufficient. It is always a prey to an act of nothingness that continually sets the prospect of living before me. And to finish, I just want to briefly mention Wittgenstein's uncertainty and his meditations on the question of and his meditations are on, on, on what is certainty and how we know anything for certain. But one of the questions is, how do I know this is my hand? And, and what he, I mean, it's, it's long and complex, and I, summarizing it is very tricky. But anyway, um, what, what, quick, one quote from Vic Stein is that he, he asked, how do I know that this is my hand? Do I even know exactly what it means to say it is my hand? When I say, how do I know? I do not mean to say that I have the least doubt of it. What we have here is a foundation of all my action, but it seems to me wrongly expressed by the words I know. And I would just generalize that to the whole body. I do not know that this is my body. Um, there's no meaningful question in relation to my body, body, bodyliness. So if I had a massive stroke, or there's a particular kind of stroke where you forget that your one limb actually belongs to you, you neglect that limb foreign object. So in those kind of situations, you know, whether it's your body does become a question. But that's a very extreme kind of situation. Wittgenstein rather nicely says, it strikes him as fishy if these kind of statements are held to be those we can know with certainty. He wonders if it should strike him as fishy. His question is around the use of the words I know in situation that appears to be meaningless to doubt. For example, this is my hand. You know, for example, the baby does not know it has hands. I mean, you mentioned as an example with the baby as well. Um, yet at birth, it has a grasping reflex, and some weeks later, as, as, it, de as, it, develops, as it develops, it develops for things. The finger grasp seems special, as it often accompanied by eye contact with the person whose finger is being grasped, at least as the child gets older. You might want to say, here is something deep in us, something instinctual, but it does not involve knowledge in any sense of something learnt or something that involves semantic representation, something that can be questioned and tested. So I think I'll, I'll finish there. <laughs>